Support for your fantastic mind, provided by Southern Company Foundation. Welcome to Your Fantastic Mind, I'm Jay Watson. This week, we have three different stories for you that have one big thing in common. They are about second chances at health and in life. So we begin this week with Libby Ingram, a married mom of two who thought she was just stressed or tired, like a lot of moms, but it turns out it was much more than that. Hey John, you wanna throw a little bit? Tossing a Frisbee in the driveway with her 14-year-old son should be a cinch for Libby Ingram. A six foot, one inch tall, former all SEC college volleyball star. Her hand-eye coordination was keen until now. I started feeling badly probably about two or three months ago. And then about a month and a half ago, two months ago, I started having numbness down my left side. It's like at the base, it just feels really tight and full. Um, I get double vision and I just get these feelings of feeling very um, panicked, like just out of control, like I, things aren't right. Is it good, John? Yummy? Libby thought it was getting older. She thought it was stress. Do you want some more? Mom to twin 14-year-old boys, one who is non-speaking with autism. Ice cream is good. Libby's husband, Peter, was also diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And that was one thing. That's that too much for most people down. by any standard. Somebody wrote very Full disclosure, thought, Libby is one of my dearest friends. Give me a high five. That's why this outgoing, gregarious, optimistic woman allowed us to chronicle what happened to her. In the brain, there's kind of a, a sort of a set of rivers of, of, of brain fluid uh, that go through the center of the brain and then ultimately have to go out through a narrow corridor called the aqueduct of Sylvius. Um, and this corridor, all the fluid in the brain has to exit there and eventually get back out and get reabsorbed. If this aqueduct, this little river, gets blocked, um, even occasionally or partially, it can create some of these symptoms. Emory neurosurgeon Dr. John Willey diagnosed Libby with intermittent obstructive hydrocephalus, meaning her spinal fluid was being blocked from leaving her brain. What was blocking it? A cyst growing on her pineal gland. So there's a, a gland deep in the brain called the pineal gland. It sometimes develops cysts, called pineal cysts. And most of the time, they just are there and they don't cause problems. Most pineal cysts never need any sort of operation whatsoever. We just find them incidentally on MRI scans. In Libby's case in particular, she had a cyst, but it was sizable enough and it was sort of pointing down to where it was obstructing the flow. Uh, into the aqueduct. It was probably the size of my finger, the tip of my finger, which is not big, but in a very small area of the brain, that, that was obstructive. The aqueduct that we're dealing with that can be blocked is literally just a millimeter wide. I'd known that I had this cyst in my head from years ago after a concussion, and it was large then, and they said, well, you still have enough room, so you should be okay, but let's just track it and follow it and just life gets, kind of gets in the way. We tracked it for a couple of years and then I hadn't really tracked it in a while. But every night would the be- The cyst was growing bigger, sure. impeding Libby's use of one side of her body, giving her constant double vision, headaches and sleep deprivation. Left untreated in severe cases, it could lead to coma or death. You know what mom's having tomorrow? John Paul and I use you a letter board to tomorrow. communicate and um, we've been doing this now since he was eight. B, R, A, I, and brain, S, U, you're right, R, keep going, G, E, go to it, R, yeah, she's having brain surgery. I really feel like I will be fine. I feel like my doctor is amazing and I have a lot of faith that it's all going to be Great. I have a lot of faith that Peter's going to be around for many years. So, um, you know, I'm probably, I'm an, op an optimist, as you well know. <laughs> so Libby, who takes care of everyone else in her life, had to put herself first. 
We arrive at the hospital before dawn. Mwah. Libby's family and her son Thomas keep her company before surgery. I hurt my knee. Yeah, how'd you hurt it? Um, um, it's fine. It's fine. Um, we need to buy you some new shoes when I'm home. I'll hopefully be home this weekend. So the plan is to uh, shave a little patch of hair about this size. The little window through the skull is about this big. So okay. It's than a dime. All right. Um, and then we use navigation to create the, the ideal trajectory to get to exactly where we want to. So it's a, a pass through a little thin layer of cortex, the surface of the brain, okay. to get to that fluid space in the brain, the ventricle. Okay. And then everything from there is navigating through that fluid space with little tiny cameras okay. on flexible little tubes. It's like you have a river that's being dammed up and so it's creating a lake. Okay. And that lake is what's causing the pressure. We're going to knock a hole in the beaver dam okay. to get rid of that obstruction. Okay. But we don't know if we'll, we've actually gotten rid of the beaver and the beaver's not going to rebuild the dam. <laughs> right. So while we're going to alleviate that obstruction, we're also going to create a little bypass so the fluid can get out in case the beaver tries to rebuild the dam. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, there's a high chance that the cyst comes back, which is why we have the backup plan of creating a bypass. I was talking to a friend who had something done with a cyst at one time, but his was in his pituitary. Mm -hmm. And he said they took some fat from mm -hmm. somewhere and plugged it in. Do you have to do that to me? Do you want me to? If you, it's right here. Uh -huh. <laughs> like like as much as that. you want. Yeah, yeah I'd be no, thrilled. No, That'd no, be it's, really. It's not that type of surgery. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. After goodbyes, Libby is wheeled to the OR. You see, the cyst is right here. It's blocking the way. A small hole is drilled in Libby's skull to create a window, and then Dr. Willie passes a camera through a tube-like straw deep into her brain. What looks like a pulsating bubble is the cyst that has been blocking the flow of her cerebral spinal fluid. Dr. Willie uses a cauterizing tool to punch a hole in the cyst. We saw where the cyst was, made a little hole in the cyst, with the hole in the cyst, you can see the small tunnel where the fluid needs to exit and how the cyst had been blocking it. Dr. Willie uses a forceps-like device and then a neuroendoscopy balloon to make sure the cyst is widely open. After draining the cyst and removing part of the cyst wall, Dr. Willie does a ventriculostomy, basically creating a new small bypass so that if the cyst comes back, Libby's spinal fluid will have a way out. <laughs> 18 months later, a lot has changed. I feel great. I feel like a, the old me again. Peter is in remission. Life is busier than ever. But with her health restored, Libby is up to the daily challenge, whatever may come. And now to another mom who thought she was beginning to experience signs of not aging so well. Some of those changes were internal, but others were changes to her physical appearance. It would take Laura Christenberry a decade before she would learn she had an incredibly rare condition. It was a gradual thing. The hardest thing to, to put your finger on is just a general sense of and wellness. Laura Christenberry can't remember exactly when her health began to fail her, when the edges of her life, once bright with possibilities, began to darken. Really subtle and gradual. I had to have my ring resized probably eight years ago. And then when it, I outgrew it the second time, I just put it away. Just put it away for because it was so uncomfortable. And so I your hands are bigger? Or you're bigger, fleshier. Her shoes went up two and a half sizes. My lips have gotten bigger, my nose. Uh, this is all just kind of, I guess, fleshed out a little bit. And then the, the, the furrow and the creases have been gradual. I just thought I wasn't really aging very well. <laughs> but oh well, you know, there's more important things. Laura's husband, right. Joe. But even when I look back at photos of Laura, um, everybody else sees these changes that I still don't even see. I see some minor things, but I guess it's been such a gradual process for me that I still, even the photos, I still see her. I just see Laura. But then she got high blood pressure. Laura's blood pressure had always been very low. And then arthritis. She developed sleep apnea, 
headaches. Her creativity seemed to vanish. She withdrew from life a bit. A decade into these seemingly disconnected issues, a random encounter changed her life. My dad was having some surgery. Uh, his ENT came out to speak with me afterward and just to tell me how he was doing. And he kept looking at my hands and my face. And he finally just said, are you seeing an endocrinologist? And I said, no. And he said, well, you might want to get your growth hormone checked because people with a growth hormone problem have a certain look and you have that look. So I said, okay. And he said, and your dad's okay. And da, 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 you know, see you in a few minutes. And so I went back to my seat in the waiting room and I Googled um, uh, large hands or enlarged hands growth hormone. And there it was, acromegaly. And I pulled up a result and it was like, uh, you know, high blood pressure, check, arthritis, check, sweating, check, you know, these changes in larger hands and feet, check. Acromegaly is a condition, a medical condition, that's caused by um, too much growth hormone. Growth hormone plays an important role in bone density and healthy muscle, in how our bodies collect fat, and in our cholesterol levels. It's also needed for normal brain function. We see the brain. Emory neurosurgeon Dr. Nelson Oyusiku is globally renowned as a pituitary surgeon and acromegaly expert. She had a tumor um, in a gland called the pituitary gland that sits at the base of the brain. And the, the pituitary is the orchestra conductor, if you will, of all the other endocrine organs. So it sets the tone, the pace uh, for production of hormones from other organs. Like an orchestra, um, things need to be har harmonious, right? And they need to be, there should be no dissonance, nobody going off kilter on their own. And so the pituitary acts as the conductor for the, for the endocrine system and keeps everything on an even keel. Not too much, not too little, just enough, at the right time, not too late, not too early. Lars tumor on the pituitary gland was less than two centimeters and was autonomous, meaning it was pumping out growth hormone relentlessly, altering her appearance and seriously damaging her health. Your face changes. You become prognathic. That means your jaw begins to protrude. Your forehead becomes more prominent your malar eminence has become more prominent. The soft tissue uh, becomes more dense and, and, and so forth. Your hands, the digits, um, become um, thicker. Inside of you, things are changing as well. So the things that you see on the outside are the one thing, but inside of you, things change. Oyusiku says some people develop a dangerous heart condition. Laura didn't. Your internal organs get enlarged. Your pancreas makes more insulin than it should. It's a very profound illness, um, um, and um, it really has a wide footprint uh, across the body. The fact Laura was not diagnosed for so long is sadly typical in a condition that affects 50 to 70 out of every 1 million people. Most patients that we see and other practitioners see um, have been misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed uh, uh, for at least an uh, eight-year period, at least eight years. So Laura would be consistent with that. She's a decade into it. Nobody quite knows what's going on. It was not good news to find out that I had a tumor growing inside me that we're going to have to get out and deal with. But it was so affirming at the same time. It was like, I'm not losing my mind. I, uh, there's a reason I don't feel like myself. I'm hoping that this is going to mean I get my old self back. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Yeah. All Ready set. Ready to do it. Ready to go. And then when I wake up, this thing will be out of me. That's right. Yeah. That's the plan. Surgery will hopefully restore Laura's health. And the operative field is through the nose, so it's not a big field as you might expect. We use an instrument called an endoscope, so it's like a little tiny rod lens and it's designed to go through the nasal aperture and it is capturing the image providing illumination light and high intensity light into the field because we're operating deep inside the nose so it's about nine centimeters is dark like a cave you can't see without the light so the ENT surgeon uh, ear nose and throat surgeon we work in combination gets us through the nose into an air chamber behind the nose called the sphenoid sinus and in that chamber, 
uh, is the last entry, gateway, if you will, to the base of the brain, which is bone, of course. So we have to drill the bone at a very high speed using a diamond drill. And you have to be extraordinarily careful because on either side of the pituitary lie the arteries that supply the brain with blood, called the carotid arteries. They are operating in a very small area with little room for error. We've opened the, the nasal cavity and at the back of the nasal cavity, there's a wall of bone and mucous tissue that has to be removed. And that's been removed, and we're looking at the base of the skull. The tumor is slightly bigger than the pituitary gland. It just pumps out growth hormone all day long. It's like a little growth hormone factory. There's the mass, there's the tumor. This whitish mass right here. See how white it looks? But this white is the tumor right there, right here. After more than a decade, Dr. Oyesiku, bit by bit, removes the tumor. So everything went very well, so nothing to worry about. Just... He takes Joe into a room to draw out for him what he did and explain a unique feature of this tumor. And the inner lining of the cyst was lined with the tumor. So it was a little bit of a challenge to get between this membrane here and the tumor membrane, but we did find it. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. well. In three months, Laura returns with significant improvements to report. My blood pressure, that's down. Um, a lot of headaches, and I'm not getting any headaches, so that's great. Um, the joint pain I still have to deal with, because some of this isn't, doesn't just magically go away. <clears throat> You know, the damage is done. It, that stuff was coursing through me for who knows how long, you know, eight, ten years before we even realized it. Sleeping? Yes. Sleeping. So, oh, I'm not snoring. I am too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can wear my ring again. I, yeah. I wasn't able to wear it for years. Where Bone has grown in her forehead and feet and hands, that cannot be reversed. But Oyusiko tells her she will continue to notice physical improvement as the tissue recedes over the next few years. Most importantly, at 54 years old, Laura has had a life-changing reset to her health. I, I think for me, this is one of the more gratifying uh, aspects of my job. A dream of every parent is for their child to grow up and leave the nest. But for 50,000 families across the country each year, their reality is that their child grows up and ages out. Among families whose children have autism, it's known as the 22-year cliff, a program to turn that cliff into a possible launch pad to independence is called My Life. I gotta brush it and I gotta straighten it and take, you know, care of it. It takes me a while because my hair is really thick. In one bathroom of her college dorm, Chloe does her hair. In the other bathroom, her roommate, Simone, gets ready. And it says to mix well. I don't know, this will hopefully taste good. And because we are there this particular morning, they made us some brownies. I made them completely from scratch. Butter, cocoa powder, flour, sugar. And then I dusted them with powdered sugar for added extra like <laughs> Just another day at college, right? And this is my room. Um, I'm gonna turn on the lights here, and oh, my room. Not quite. All right, we good. I'm really excited to be doing this, and I'm really thankful that I was given this opportunity, and I wake up, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe I'm actually here. Here is the My Life program created by the Emory Autism Center, where young adults with autism get to experience three weeks of college campus life, a fun, intensive practice run at Independence. You can get these things pop out. Unlike the made-from-scratch brownies, the boys' dorm is, well, typical. Video games and prepackaged food rule the day. But these are huge steps for adults who still live with their parents, Noah Markson is 20 years old. Getting to hang out with them, getting to eat a lot of pizza rolls, been going pretty good, honestly. 
it's something that the families very much appreciate. Psychiatrist Dr. Joe Kubels is the director of the medical and adult services at Emory Autism Center. The issue facing thousands of American families every year is when their adult child with autism ages out, losing access to much needed therapy and services they received while growing up. How many times have I met with a family, you know, who's like, you know, a month ago we had all these services and supports and now we have nothing. What do we do? It's a huge problem. S approximately 50,000 young people every year transition into adulthood, basically meaning they turn 22. Then that creates what we call the 22-year cliff. I think my favorite dinner The goal of my life is in the name, to help these young adults gain independence needed to live their own lives. And then after that... In the span of three weeks, each of the six participants will gradually challenge themselves to be more and more independent. I am Chloe, and I'm myself. From group workshops... I am now, uh, ...to social skills icebreaker activities... My name is Simone. ...to bonding... But I want you to pick a picture. ...hanging out with their peers. My life members have autism. So I'm just going to quickly go over... What All along the way, a team is leading them, and that guidance, patience, and repetition produces a change. Moving out is such a big deal because it's cutting all those safety nets. And so I think that's why this program is so invaluable. It's less like jumping off a cliff and more like bungee jumping. You're kind of testing the waters, seeing what it would be like. So what level of independence do you hope to have as an adult? Um, the kind where if anything were to happen, I could continue to function without my parents. A turkey burger right here. Have a great day. They learn to navigate the massive cafeteria on their own. They have like buffets scattered around. It's an all you can eat. It's like Golden Corral, but fancier. We're working on being independent in that because it's like our choice, what we choose to get. And trust me, some people come back with three plates of food. I'm not gonna say names, but. We already tied up the sunflower. Encouraged to pursue a passion on their own, Noah chooses gardening. Oh yeah, that I can do. And then we wanna do that on the top. Well, we will have eggplants soon. I already have the oven preheated. Chloe chooses cooking. And my grandma knows how to bake. And you always want to crack on a flat surface till you hear the crack. And then you want to gently pull apart. Very nice to meet you. Nice. And this is Phineas. And Simone loves dogs, so she does a visit with a therapy dog. How long um, does it take to train a therapy dog? Depends on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> then a big step, solo trips on public transportation. Resumes are created. There's even a build your brand contest to design a t-shirt and teams must develop a complete marketing plan. That's where this comes into play. So basically we're gonna take what we learned last week and put it into practice. The program doesn't shy away from tough issues. Hey, how you doing? I'm off for friends. Like what to do when pulled over by police. One thing that we always recommend, especially if it's multiple people in the car, to roll all the windows down especially if you have tinted windows and you can't really see that well, but just roll down all the windows. That would be, it's just like the thing we were talking about last time, officer safety. We'll have like strobe lights, or not strobe light, but a um, spotlight that, that we can shine into the vehicle. One, just because it's night, that way we can see how many occupants are in the car, because we got a call that they were suspi uh, suspicious activity. Emory police officers create role-playing opportunities to remove the unknowns. Stay calm, that was one thing we talked about a lot. What else? Hands on the wheel, show us your hands, okay. The three weeks fly by, and it's time to go home. I hope everyone got to, you know, the people that I've worked with us can kind of understand a little bit as to what autism is like and how not everybody with autism is the exact same. And we all have different um, struggles and stuff like that. So again, really thankful. I like how everything is applicable. Like, my big problem with school was, you know, I'd be learning something like how to calculate a hypo the hypotenuse or whatever, or like a obtuse circle. I'd just be wondering, what am I ever gonna use this? And uh, with a lot of the classes here, it's stuff like how to open a bank account, first aid, uh, how to cook for yourself. I didn't really do my own laundry before this. <laughs> so it was kind of a wake up call there. I thought I was independent before this class, and being in it has made me learn a lot of stuff that I was like, oh, wow. It was like they woke up to the possibility 
of living independently. Like, oh, you know what, I can do this. I, you know, I can be in my apartment. I can cook my own meals. I, I can do this if I have just a little bit of support. And that may be the great power of my life, the revelation that one day they could live their own. Probably two thirds of the autism community with really pretty modest support could really be out there, you know, frankly, earning money and paying taxes rather than, you know, needing to have Medicaid and needing society to be, you know, providing resources for them. I have my own bedroom. They're human beings. They, they want the same things we do. Being with their peers, discovering their own strengths and abilities, experiencing life in all its imperfect, marvelous wonder. I was excited to be a part of this opportunity and, you know, it's just a dream. The My Life program could not take place this past summer due to COVID, but hopes to return in the summer of 2021. And in the meantime, has gone virtual. That's gonna do it for us this week. See you next time on Your Fantastic Mind. Support for Your Fantastic Mind, provided by Southern Company Foundation.